so I'm going to switch in English to present him um, again because many of you uh, already have seen him yesterday. Uh, so Yarin is the leader of the Oxford Applied and Theoretical Machine Learning Group in Oxford. Is also associate professor in the Computer Science Department and a tutorial fellow at Christ Church. Um, so he did his PhD in the Cambridge Machine Learning Group under the supervision of Zubin uh, Garamani. If I pronounce it good, but I'm not sure. Um, so his lines of work are mainly about Bayesian deep learning. Uh, or also quantifying uncertainty in deep learning, among other topics. And um, he also focused on a lot of applications of, the, of these uh, tools in computer vision, medical, medical analysis, or autonomous driving, and so on. So there's many fields of application of that. And if I understood correctly for his presentation of today, so it will, it will uh, speak about things in the frontier between Bayesian statistics and, and deep learning uh, and trying to explore and combine those two visions to give more intuition or explanation or maybe proofs at some point uh, of uh, what's happening in, in the deep learning black box. So I, I'll let you um, speak. Yeah, so um, again, I've just very briefly the notation I'm going to be using for the talk over here. I just assume that we have x's and uh, vectors over here, y's are there, and vectors as well. x are inputs, y's are labels, w1, w2 are some weight matrices. I'll find transformations between uh, first input layer and the hidden layer, between hidden layer and output layer. We want to find normal deep learning, we want to find some w1, w2 that basically give us good mappings. Uh, lots of stuff, which I'm not going to go over that again. Uh, probability theory, I'm not going to go over that again. Uh, dropout is a tool to connect a probability theory with these deep learning tools, deep learning models. Uh, I'm going to go quickly about what it does, because that's one of the tools that I will mention later. Um, as I'm going to mention again, that there are lots of other techniques to get approximate inference in, in Bayesian deep learning. Uh, this is one of the simplest ones, where we just multiply each input unit by a draw from a build distribution, for some probability p, for example 0.5. Uh, then we multiply by w, get a hidden vector, each vector multiply each one of these things again by a draw from a build distribution probability p, for example, 0.5, we do another alpha and transformation, and then we get the output. That's stochastic forward pass. At test time, dropout does, uh, does a deterministic forward pass, where we just uh, multiply by w by w. Actually, there's a fine detail over here where we actually multiply by uh, the node and then we renormalize uh, by 1 minus p to keep the magnitude of the output uh, in each layer the same as, as if we didn't multiply by w in order to avoid having to find new weight initialization techniques because weight initialization has been studied for a long time specifically to maintain consistent output variance between different layers. Um, yeah, so we're going to get some intuition today actually in the talk into some of the empirical practices that people use when they use deep learning, uh, when they use uh, this specific technique in practice for the connection to the probabilistic models. So, uh, some questions that you might ask yourself after working with practitioners that have played a long, uh, that played for a long time with the models, some of the questions would be, why do you choose p equals 0.5? Which is a question that has always bothered me. 
Oh, like why is it like if you use if you use like a huge amount of data, then uh, you try to get p 0.5, it doesn't work, and then they tell you, oh, just use p equals 0.1. Why? Um, I'm going to try to give you some insights into these specific questions. At least for me, it has been annoying me for a long time. A lot of these are also fun that work very well in practice, but we have we had no idea why. And I'm going to give you some possible hypotheses by connecting this to probability theory to explain why we use these different things. Um, need to cover quickly Bayesian neural networks. So if you went here before, yesterday, uh, Bayesian neural network is a neural network where we put a by distribution PW over the weights of the W1 or W2. Uh, so now this is a pro probabilistic model. Uh, if you define a likelihood, which is the probability of Y conditioned on some W, you give me some weight W, some realization for W. You give me some input text, and if I define a likelihood P of Y conditioned W in X, then multiplying the Y by the likelihood in normalizing, I can find the posterior. What are the more likely less likely parameters conditioned on the data? Uh, this is actually very difficult to evaluate. Yesterday I kind of skipped over that. There's a huge amount of literature people trying to evaluate, approximate this quantity, this posterior of W condition X and Y for these Bayesian neural network models. Actually, I spent some time digging into the history of the field, trying to find that actually what they, like, they work in the earlier days people tried to do to, do the, to approximate that. And the earliest mentions I actually managed to find two Bayesian neural networks are from 1987 or 88. A work from uh, their labs, I think, uh, uh, Denker, uh, uh, Tishby, and others. I'm hoping I'm not confusing names. Uh, with the introduction of these sort of ideas of let's put the distribution of a neural network weights, people also said, oh, let's try to find the posteriors. And a lot of the earlier work looked at uh, analytic ways of doing that for binary models or Laplace approximations. So I think in 1989, Yan Likun had a paper on trying to do approximate, approximate inference in these Bayesian neural networks using a Laplace approximation of the W. Um, there actually, there's so much other literature which is pretty interesting. So after 90, after 89, there was in 91, uh, uh, Jeff Hinton, Hinton and Van Kamp, basically had a paper, on, again, looking at these Bayesian neural networks, trying to do approximate inference from a compression perspective, actually. But all the mathematics are exactly the same. Developing the tools of what we call today approximate version of inference. Uh, Fast forward a couple of years, when you have in 94, 95, we have uh, David Mackay, Radford Neal, working on HMC Monte Carlo techniques to approximate this very, very, very difficult quantity. Um, 98, you had uh, David Barber and Chris Bishop working on building structured approximations for that. And then for a long time, nobody, everyone forgot about it. For a long time, nobody cared about these models anymore. Everyone switched to other stuff. Basically, deep learning was not interesting anymore. Um, for a long time until I think about 2011 or 7, I'm not sure, maybe I'm confusing the dates, but I think there was, in the early 2010s, there was a paper by Alex Graves that basically proposed what I consider to be the first modern approach of doing approximate inference in these sort of tools from a completely different perspective, not mentioning the word Bayesian even once for the entire paper. So similar to Hinton, he was following up on that kind of work, looking at the compression literature, minimum description length literature, uh, proposing ways of using uh, stochastic optimization to actually do this thing at scale for models which are actually interesting, which are more than just toy models. Um, a couple of years after that, there has been a bunch of other interesting works building up on these sort of ideas, and that's a sort of that's a line of research that we follow over here as well, which is using the same uh, the same combination of the same statistical tools, but a different interpretation. Instead of using instead of using a, a compression interpretation, we basically use a probabilistic interpretation. So the approximate version inference interpretation for the same mathematics. We we'll define a simple distribution Q to approximate this very complicated distribution P, and then we basically just use approximate version inference. Um, so one of the main results I showed yesterday was if you do approximate inference with a Q distribution of this specific structure, which today is a bit more important for what we're going to talk about. So what we have over here is that for a specific W, for a specific weight matrix W, which are these, that's A W, 
which in terms of basically from input dimensionality to heat dimensionality, from four, like a, that's a four by five matrix. The distribution of the W would be take a deterministic matrix M, the mean matrix, multiply that by a diagonal that has the Woody and variables with probability P on the diagonal. So that, that actually should be Q of M comma P. We have two rational parameters, M and P. The expectation of Q with respect to the Bernoulli will just be M, so that's the mean parameter. And P basically, uh, uh, P is used to parameter as Bernoulli that lies on the diagonal of this matrix. So we multiply the M by P, we're gonna, that's, a, that's as the effect of setting entire rows or columns, depends on whether you do multiply or post multiply. Uh, setting entire rows or columns of M to zero. So a stochastic, a realization, a W realization from Q will basically be M where some of the columns will be set to zero, probability P for each column. Um, so yeah, so if we use this Q distribution, then the optimization objective for stochastic Russian inference with, a, uh, with this model here will be identical to the objective of a drop at neural network. So if you see that and implement approximate pressure inference with a skewed distribution, you will be implementing, you will basically be writing the same amount, you will be writing the same code, line to line, of just implementing drop out, which we started from. Um, and that's a picture of approximate inference with a Bayesian neural network with a drop out. With that, so that's actually with drop out, uh, this, that with this skewed distribution, that's with the drop out uh, approximating distribution over the network weights. So this is basically what it looks like. It looks very much like a Gaussian process when you think about that. In the sense of, you actually have like these very smooth functions over here, and then you have the variability of the functions that can explain the data, and then you have this nice uncertainty envelope, which is larger far away from the data, smaller than the data. Yesterday we looked at some applications of what we can actually do with these uncertainty envelopes. Today we're gonna try to get some more insight into different properties of these ones. I am, again, I'm gonna skip this slide keeps keeping that slide, maybe it's just a bit. Um, uh, so to give you an algorithmic, view, an algorithmic view of how to do basically a, of what's going on over here, is that uh, we have some uh, we have some distribution of the W, and the predictive distribution is basically going to be P of Y condition on X. So P of Y condition on X is simply marginalizing over W, marginalizing over the W posterior. Because this is the approximate W posterior, to marginalize over W posterior, what all we need to do is just, you can just do Monte Carlo integration, just sampling from this Q, which is the approximate posterior, and then evaluating Ys for each W that we sample, which is literally these four lines of code. You do drop at the test line, which is sample A realization from your posterior, feed your input through that model to get A Y, and then that's basically a, a draw from the predicted distribution, and then, uh, and then do the, well, that would be a draw, from, then do that 10 more times, and that's basically gonna give you 10 draws from the predicted distribution, um, which then you can look at the mean and bias for that to see how confident you are in your prediction. How confident you are in your prediction, uh, if your mean, uh, if your bias is very high, then you're not confident if your, if your variance is very low, like near the data, then you are certain. When you set the near the data, you get then less and less certain as you get farther away from the data. Uh, yeah, so, we have enough time. We have actually quite a bit of stuff today. So we're gonna look at a different view at learning small amounts of data. Yesterday we looked at an application of that in the context of astronomy. Today we're gonna try to understand a bit more about different uh, but uh, we're going to talk again about active learning, but we're going to try to understand a bit more about acquisition functions. And some recent results that we just, uh, just got uh, accepted to NIPS, which is how to do acquisition functions with batches of points, which is surprisingly challenging, computing mutual information in high dimensions. Uh, we're going to look at uh, principled uh, extensions compared to ad hoc, so optimizing the dropout of mobility, which I referred to before. Uh, we're going to look at more interesting losses than just using a mean squared loss or just using a softmax loss. We're going to look at uh, alpha divergences. 
And then we can look at how we can use these ideas to get uh, robustness in, in to adversarial examples. We can actually show that we can identify adversarial examples uh, with implications to AI safety. Um, what we're not going to talk about, but you definitely should look up online, there's some recent work that we have on verification. So we have some guarantees for what these uncertainties, specifically properties of these uncertainties from the verification literature. Um, we have some other recent work actually showing that we can do detective set examples in large real world scenarios and some other fun stuff. I'm going to talk about that more later. So, yeah, so let's talk about again active learning. This is the cycle that we talked about yesterday. For example, if you want to diagnose melanoma with a handful of images, then you start by collecting some images of melanoma, some of them benign, some of them malignant, some of them cancerous, some of them are not cancerous. Uh, and you ask an expert to sit down and label them. The issue is that if you ask an expert to sit down and label all of them, it's going to cost you a lot of money, it's going to be infeasible, it's going to be very much not, it's not going to adapt to changing distributions if you want to deploy your system in a different city and stuff like that. You need to find ways of making this sort of site, basic diagnostics, uh, efficient and where you can incorporate your data in efficient ways as well. One way of doing that is collecting some data, trying the, getting the expert to label only the first two images, only the first part, batch of the data. Fit a model on that, evaluate an acquisition function, basically which of the unlabeled data points are interesting, which are not interesting. Get an expert to label only the top k interesting points, add these back to the data set, and then retrain the model. Um, we talked yesterday about one way of doing a position function is using um, a uncertainty. So we can use the epistemic uncertainty rather than a toric uncertainty to find where we have gaps in the data. So a data point basically would have high position function if you if we you would want it to have high position function if it's very different from anything that we've seen before and the model has high epistemic uncertainty over that. One way of evaluating that in a concrete way is looking at the mutual information, the information gained about the model parameters uh, given the data point. So this is stuff that we didn't go in detail yesterday. We just said, oh, we're just going to use some position function which we called bold and we explain at all what's, what's going on. So today we're going to get into a bit more detail about that. There are actually many different possible acquisition functions that you can use that still like, that take uncertainty into account. There are different ways of measuring the uncertainty. And we can look at the predictive entropy, which is you take your predictive distribution, which is what we talked about before, the P of Y condition on X, integrating over W, and just look at the entropy for that distribution. We can look at the mutual information between the model parameters and the label Y. Basically, how much information would we gain about the model parameters if you gave me, if you were to give me Y at that data point, at that input X. That's also referred to as Bayesian active learning by disagreement, and people often refer to that acquisition function, which is just rich information, as the board acquisition function. You can also look at more ad hoc uh, approaches like variational ratios, uh, which I think is used in the, uh, I think it was in bioinformatics literature, uh, where we look at the highest probability, predictive probability under Y, the highest uh, probability under possible classes, and then one minus that. Um, and we can look at some of obvious baseline, obviously, it would be just random position, uniformly, uniformly select a point from the pool set uh, to get an expert to label. So, some interesting first observations is that uh, if, if you do active learning uh, using the tools we talked about before for approximate inference, and we use the border position function over here, then we can actually see, look at that, we have very nice improvement over the deterministic baseline. And the same for the other acquisition functions as well. Max entropy, max entropy is very not good, but both the natural relation ratios work very well in practice. Uh, you can also look at the number of acquired images that we have to get to get to a specific error of uh, performance. So if you want to get to 5% error on MNIST, so this is on MNIST data set. Um, then on board we had to get 335 points compared to randomly acquiring 835 points to get to the same performance, averaging the experiment five times and so on. Um, 
we can actually do some equivalent study as well, where uh, we uh, the other way is starting with, I think, 100 points up to 1,000 points in total. So that's basically getting 5% error rate on MNIST with 100, uh, 300 points over here. Um, you can look at what's the best results we can do on MNIST with 1,000 labeled examples in total. And you can compare active learning to semi supervised learning techniques, which make use of the entire unlabeled data set in order to learn good representations. Over here, these are the performance, these are the results, like we said, the other results at the time on uh, semi supervised learning, which gets really good at 1.3% on uh, uh, virtual DCR networks and uh, gamma ladder networks at 1.53. Um, and comparing that with the active learning with different acquisition functions. Where just the baseline, if you just take a thousand subset, random subsets from any sort of thousand data points, you're going to get 4.66, which is fairly larger than 1.32. Surprisingly lower than uh, semi supervised embeddings over here, the def 5.73, which is worse than just randomly sucking a data set, but okay. Um, but you can get 1.64 um, by using version ratios, for example, uh, with a thousand. <coughs> A acquisition, a thousand data points in total acquired from the data set. Uh, so that's actually quite cool. It's basically competitive with uh, semi supervised learning. Uh, applying the same techniques for a medical data set, going back to the melanoma diagnostics data set, we actually applied the same data, the same technique to, this, to these actually images. Uh, the data set in total, I think, was 300 images. So this is fairly different from the setup we had yesterday. Yesterday we had lots of data. Just most of the data kind of look the same, but you had to decide what is worth labeling. Over here, we actually have a tiny amount of data. We have 300, 300 images in total, and we actually need to decide which one of these we want to get the expert to label. When you have a tiny amount of data, doing any experiments becomes very challenging, because any, any uh, reordering of the data you're going to do for the experiment is going to give you very different results. So I don't know if it, it's pretty difficult to see the uncertainty bounds over here uh, for the um, um, standard error that we have in this plot. But that actually was very challenging where you need to do uh, acquisition size over here was 50 at every time step. Um, and then uh, basically you have to do like repeat the experiment like 10 times with different uh, mixing permutations of the data just to make sure that you actually get statistically relevant results. Because the test set is like the size of 100 data points in total. Um, you, you do see that there is a statistically significant improvement using the which information could be uniform. I think this is much more interesting. So this is related to one of the ports I had yesterday, which I didn't go over in, in detail because I didn't have enough time. But that's a number of positive examples that we acquire with active learning compared to just randomly sampling from the data set. So one of the biggest issues with medical applications and lots of other applications is that we often have unbalanced data. In this case, we actually have 20% positives only in the data set. And if you sample uniformly from the data set, if you sample, I don't know, 100 points from the data set uniformly, then only 20 points are going to be positive. You're going to have a tiny, tiny number of positive examples. Um, if you actually ask the model, which do you think are going to be the most interesting points? And the model actually says, oh, I want to get all the positives first. So the x-axis is the acquisition step, y-axis is the number of positives. And you can see uniform is just a line, the frequency of the, data, the, frequency of the positives in the data set. And the uh, blue line, the active learning, is basically very quickly acquires all the positives. And then at the end, basically just says, uh, uh, there's no, nothing more interesting to acquire. If you force me, I'm going to take some more negatives. Um, so okay, so this is a work from 2017. We've done some follow-up work on that. So this is from 2019. So this is something new. We have a similar experiment over here. We're looking at MNIST. We can ignore the yellow line for the moment. We have a we have the or we have a purple line, which is the active learning, and we have the green line over here, which is random acquisition. So this is a data set built on top of feminist, it has specific properties, which we're going to talk about in a second, but there's, it has a very specific property that somehow makes active learning perform very, very badly over here. This is actually very interesting. So we started digging into what's going on. We acquired 20 points 
at the time to get over here. So we do batch acquisitions. We sample that we do active learning with top take the top 20 most interesting points. And then we do return the model, a valid and acquisition function, again take the top 20 most interesting points. And we found that active learning actually performs worse than just random acquisition. So what's going on here? So before I actually tell you what's going on, anyone actually wants to guess what's going on? Anyone has any idea of what could be a property of the data set where you take the top 20 most interesting points and you get worse performance than just something at under? So the answer is redundancy. So if you take the top 20 most interesting points with active learning, with both, basically what you're doing in practice is this. I don't know if you can see that too well. So you have an acquisition function over the top 20 points. We basically look at all subsets of size 20. And then we basically select the 20 most informative points according to that thing, add it to the data set, that thing, where we just set most and uh, top 20 most interesting points, literally says that. So it says, look at the mutual information for each individual point, how important that point individually would be, sum them all together, and then take the points that basically maximize the set of 20 points that maximize this sum. This is very different. That's very much not the same as looking at the joint mutual information of a set of 20 points together with the model parameters, which is this thing, which actually is, turns out to be surprisingly difficult to evaluate. I'm not going to get into detail how to actually approximate that thing. But I'm going to give you a bit more intuition into what's going on with the failure mode, which actually is very interesting over here. So mutual information visually can be, visual, can be represented as follows. So omega over here is the set, uh, is, a, is basically a random variable. Y condition X is another random variable. And you can think of mutual information as the overlap in um, as overlap between these different sets. Can you, I don't know if you can see that the shade of, you can't really see the shade. So um, over here we have like dark gray, over here we have light gray, over here we have light gray. When we take this thing, we basically double count the mutual information. I think it's fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What's going on in the slides? Are they readable? No. Um, what did you change before? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think, I think the text is mm -hmm. Maybe. No. Yeah. Is that better for the text? Yes. So basically, when we do this thing, we end up double counting. Mutual information should be basically the overlap between uh, y1, like the variable y1 condition x1 and omega 
Well, the mutual information for the joint between y, y1, 2, and 3 in omega will basically be the overlap. And when we do this thing, we basically count the mutual information between y1 and omega, y2 and omega, y3 and omega. y1, I'm not sure why it says y1 here. Um, and whenever these things overlap, whenever y1 and y2 overlap, then basically we end up double counting lots of stuff. Uh, in a visual way, uh, a different way of looking at stuff is literally looking at uh, redundancy. So if I generate this data set, which is actually the data set we had before, we have lots of A's that kind of look the same, but not exactly the same. Fires kind of look the same, but not exactly the same. Threes but kind of look the same, but not exactly the same. And my data set, my modern data set eight before, then is going to have very high bold acquisition value, very high mutual information for eight, but for all the eights. The issue is that if I take the top three most like most uncertain points, I'm basically going to take eight, eight, eight. I'm not going to take into account that once I saw a single eight, I should know all the other eights as well. So what we did over here was basically develop a way of tractably evaluating the mutual information between uh, within the joint of multiple y labels, which in effect basically says, okay, if I had an eight, then I don't really care what the other eights now. They give me a five. Okay, if I have a five, I don't really care what the other fives now. Give me a three. So if I force you to select the top three most important points jointly, it will take these diverse set, other than this homogeneous set. Uh, in practice, what how that's implemented is actually a very neat uh, algorithm aligned on uh, submodularity. Uh, what relying on, it's a great algorithm that basically can rely on sub submodularity of the acquisition function to prove some guarantees about it. So we start with an empty batch of no position at all. And we compute the, just the normal uh, and we compute the mutual information for every unable data point that we have in the set. We take the single point that is the highest scoring, highest score, we add it to x, and add that x to a, and we repeat this process until a is full of the acquisition size. Basically, the next time we evaluate the batch uh, information for the joint with additional set, with additional, uh, additional point. Basically, that allows us to solve the issue of it allows us to solve the issue of finding an argmax over a set of uh, 10, 20 points. Because otherwise, this is going to be, if you have, if you have I don't know, 1,000 unlabeled points, then selecting, going over all possible subsets of size 10 is going to basically be exponentially expressed. It's going to be 1,000 to the power of O of 1,000 to the power of 10. Um, so this basically, uh, this basic, this greedy algorithm allows us to evaluate that in a much more well, linear time. This greedy algorithm turns out to be optimizing, well, computing a submodular function, acquisition function over here. Basically, uh, I don't have the definition over here for the submodularity, but that basically means that we guaranteed that we're going to pick the, uh, uh, we're going to pick points with a. And you get the algorithm picks points with a guarantee that the score is at least 1 minus 1 over E, which is basically 63% as good as the optimal choice. So this is a paper that was just published, uh, will be published this year at NIPS. And going back to the plot we had before, so that's basically the dashboard. That's basically looking at the joint uh, mutual information between a set of points, uh, rather than looking at some of the individual mutual information uh, between individual points, but ends up working both and just randomly uniformly something from the data set. So that's very nice. Um, that leads us to the next topic, next um, next example that we have over here, which is the stuff I mentioned before. This is pretty bad. Can you actually see what's going on in this box over here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
So yeah, so we were talking we we were talking earlier about how to how to value actually how do we find the dropout probability p? And the naive thing that you can try to do is basically say, oh, let's just differentiate respect to p and optimize it. That's not going to work because Bernoulli is a discrete uh, distribution, and if you just try to diff take your tensor flow by the model and say differentiate respect to p, you're going to get zero gradient. You can say, oh, in that case, I'm just going to stick with Gondel softmax distribution, which is a, a concrete distribution, which is just a relaxation of the discrete distribution. Just stick that into my model and then optimize that. A concrete distribution basically looks like this. So instead of having a single delta, we have a narrow thing over here, which is like a Gaussian, but not a Gaussian. And when we integrate that, we get this. Uh, instead of having a step function, we have a, a, a CDF, which is actually differentiable. So you can say, oh, okay, let's just stick this number softmax uh, variable into my model and we'll optimize that. That's not going to work either, because when you optimize that, what you're going to find is that optimal p will just be, don't do dropout, just let me overfit the data. <laughs> so I think the main question is, what do you actually want to tune over here? So we have something that we can tune, we can wiggle this p parameter, but what do we want to maximize when we tune this, when we wiggle this p parameter? P parameter? Well, so that goes back to the objective we talked about before, which we never actually give the concrete form for. Um, so this is the elbow. That's the negative elbow, actually. Um, which is the objective that we have in the approximate variational inference, which we talked about earlier today. Um, if you remember the notation that we had, xi is an input point, yi is output point, w is the in this case, just compounding all the weight matrices. Fw is just the output from the function, from the neural network on input x. P of y condition Fw is the likelihood we talked about. P of w over here is the prior that we talked about. Q of w over here is the approximate posterior that we talked about, the dropout distribution. What we have over here is we have the log likelihood, negative log likelihood, plus the pullback likelihood divergence between the posterior, approximate posterior and the prior distribution. So this is actually the objective that we had, that I, which I basically skipped over, and I just said, oh, we're going to do approximate inference. That is approximate inference. That's how you get Q to be similar to the posterior P. Uh, yeah? Are we good? No, we see all of the <laughs> uh, this Q distribution can actually, the K put the line between Q and P can actually be approximated very well using this form, which is L squared. L is some parameter which is not important, times 1 minus P. P is the dropout probability over 2 times the L2 squared of the weight matrix M, the main parameter for that, minus K. K is the number of hidden units, or the model size basically, times the entropy of, entropy of P. Uh, entropy of P, just if you don't remember, is defined as negative P log P, one P log Y P. I think a natural question that you should ask yourself when you see this objective is, why is that a good objective? Like, why should I use this objective? It's some objective. It happens to be, if you ignore this term, then this thing over here is equivalent to the dropout objective, which we talked about before. If you implement dropout, then you do uh, estimate this with a Monte Carlo something, then you do a stochastic forward pass and then look at the log likelihood. But we didn't really talk about this term so far. This term over here is composed of the L2 penalty of the weight matrix, which is some, something that you often do in deep learning, plus the very interesting term over here, which until now we didn't talk about at all. And I think a key question is what does that term do? So does that term actually make sense? Like, what does it contribute to this objective if I didn't if I didn't ignore that? So if I just fix my dropout p to be 0.5, then this term has no effect. That's just going to be a constant term, and then my objective is just going to be the normal dropout objective plus L2 penalty plus a constant. So it's fine. Nobody cares about it. <laughs> um, but if you actually want to optimize p, then this term becomes very, very important. And you should ask yourself, what does that term actually do? So we're going to try to get an insight into what that term does. So let's, first of all, just look at this equation. So what do you think p does? So what do you think this term, entropy of p, does in the objective over here? By just looking at the asymptotics of this objective. 
So again, this is just the log likelihood, which is the same as just the loss that you have in your model over a stochastic fault pass, plus a bunch of penalty terms, normalized by n, n number of data points. m is the batch size. So if, uh, if you have very large batches, m is going to be larger. If you have very large data, n is going to be larger. Um, L over here is some constant, which is very interesting to interpret what it does. 1 minus p is the 1 minus entropy probability. k is model size. And then we have entropy of p. So what do you think will happen as the number of data points goes to infinity? What will be the optimum p? So that then? One half. Well, as the number of data points n goes to infinity, this term diminishes because this thing doesn't depend on n. Yeah? So this term basically tends to zero, and we just have this thing. So if you just have this thing, then what would happen if we had p 0.5? And what would happen if we had p 0.1 or 0.01 or 0.0001 or not? So as long as I have p, which is larger than not, I'm always going to inject some stochasticity in the, in, in the forward pass. I always have some chance that my prediction will be incorrect, and I can actually never perfectly overfit my data. So as long as I have non-zero p, I have some chance of having non-zero loss over here, and I'm going to be penalized for that. Therefore, as n tends to infinity, actually p tends towards zero. And you can actually prove that, uh, other than just looking at the equation. It's a very nice proof. Uh, you can look up online, uh, you can send that like, you can ask me later if you want a reference for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you can actually prove these things analytically with linear models, for example. But as n goes to infinity, for yeah, as long as we keep everything else fixed, as long as k is fixed, as long as l is fixed, then optimal p will be not. Everyone happy with that? Yeah? Now, what would happen if n is fixed, but model size goes to infinity? K goes infinity. So what term will dominate the objective over here? The entropy will basically dominate the objective. Everything else basically becomes tense. If you divide by K, then everything else diminishes to zero. We just have the entropy. What's the optimum for the entropy? So P equals 0.5, one half is actually the optimum for the entropy. The entropy looks like this, between 0 and 1, between 0 and 1. And the optimum for the entropy will be 0.5. So the P equals 0.5 maximizes, uh, well, minimizes the objective, basically is an optimum for fixed data set size as the model size tends to infinity. Basically saying that if you use a larger model, then you use P equals 0.5, which is the rule of form that we talked about before. For fixed model size, as n tends to infinity, as n becomes larger and larger, P gets smaller and smaller, which is other other rule of form that we talked about. If you have lots of data, just use P equals 0.1, for example. Um, yeah, so these are two obvious insights, which basically you can see just looking at the, like the, this term over here and this term over here. Some other insights that you can look at uh, gaining from looking at the magnitude for m and the L squared term over here. Basically, that corresponds to the uh, frequency in the data, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, instead of that, um, let me skip that. I'm just going to show you some interesting empirical results. What we did over here was we took a huge computer vision model, where if you were to do grid search over the dropout probability P, which is what we talked about yesterday, as someone asked, how do you find P? I said, just do grid search. Then it would be infeasible, because each iteration for each set of p that you choose, it's going to be that three or four days just to get results for that p. It's infeasible to do to tune over p for the entire, like for the like fine enough uh, range of p. It's completely impossible to tune different p for different layers in that model. What we do over here is literally take different p for different uh, layers in the model, stick this concrete relaxation we talked about, concrete job part, and then optimize that, and then see what is the optimum p that we get. Basically allowing us to actually find optimum p for different layers throughout the model. What we find is that as number of data points increases, so this is actually a simple, this is a, a simple case experiment other than looking at the huge computer vision model that was actually literally on that linear function. 
But as the number of data points increases, we see very interesting, we see something very interesting. So over here in the x-axis, so this is just two examples of the small number of data points, large number of data points. Over here, x-axis is the number of data points. Y-axis is the total probability p for the first layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer. What you find is that if you ignore the first layer, then all of the, uh, all of the uh, p's basically start at 0.4. It's not 0.5 exactly over here, but for the model size, I guess, like that was optimum. Then as you increase the number of data points for a fixed model size, all of the p basically tends, all of the p's tend towards zero. What you also find over here is another very interesting observation, which is one of these other rule of thumb, rules of thumb that people in the community will tell you, in the engineers in the community will tell you, which is don't put job out of the input there. And you ask me why, and they say, I don't know, because it doesn't work well if I put job out of the input there. I don't actually know why optimum P, according to the objective, is zero for the input there over here, but that objective appeared over here. I, I, it's some other asymptotic, which I'm still not sure exactly where it's coming from. But optimum P for that objective, no matter how many data points you have, for the first there would be not put job out of that input there. So actually, I think that is very interesting. And uh, that's a paper also from NIPS a couple of years ago. Um, and actually, to be honest, I still don't know why the input there, uh, what this objective tells you about the input there differently from the deeper layers in the world. Uh, implementation wise, you can implement that entire concrete job thing in like 15 lines of chaos code. So like, all of these things are triggered to implement. Uh, this was an experiment with a huge computer vision model where we increase, no, maybe it's the same, sorry, it's the same, uh, it's the same data actually, but we look at how the epistemic uncertainty changes compared to a historic uncertainty, different types of uncertainty mentioned yesterday, um, how that changes as we get more and more data. And basically what we see over here is that epistemic <coughs> goes down to zero as we get more and more data. Uh, and the toric stays the same, because obviously you get more data, I shouldn't expect the amount of observation noise to go down. Um, epistemic goes down to zero, which is actually makes sense when you optimize P. As you get more and more data, P tends to zero over here. P equals zero, you have a deterministic model. Epistemic consensus equals zero. Every stochastic fault pass gives you the same output. So all the epistemic consensus goes away, basically. Last example I have. Last, last application example that I have over here is using uh, interesting glosses in deep learning. Specifically, what we're looking at over here is Amari's alpha divergences. In the most general form, it looks like that. It has some very well-known specific cases, like the Kullback library, Kullback library QP, expectation respect to Q of log Q over P, uh, when alpha equals naught. Alpha is over here. Alpha tends to naught. The Hellinger distance with alpha equals 0.5, and the pullback library P to Q, which is the opposite inverse KL, as alpha tends to 1. In the visual form, you can think about this as like mode covering or mode seeking, something that's interesting. VB corresponds to this case, version base, uh, expectation progression corresponds to this case. Um, so if you think of the likelihood, the P of Y condition next in W, which we had before, as the exponent of some negative loss of the neural network output on X and the rate of Y, and our wire now is gonna, we're gonna write it down explicitly as zero and lambda inverse. Approximate distribution Q is just gonna factorize on different weights. Approximate inference, normal approximate version of inference. If Monte Carlo approximation, it looks like this, which is the same equation that we had before. Now over here we just have multiple k samples rather than a single, a single sample. Instead of doing a single dropout forward pass, we actually do k uh, dropout passes uh, as part of the objective uh, optimization. So basically we evaluate the, the loss at the neural network input x, we do dropout test time, and this is some omega hat, which is a draw from the distribution of omegas, which is our set of our w's. And then we have the pullback either to the y distribution, which is just L2 penalty. Turns out that we can actually get the uh, Amalis alpha divergence be a very, very simple form. It just looks like sum of log sum x of alpha times the loss plus L2 penalty. That's all. <coughs> we have one of the alpha over here. Which basically means that we can implement very, very interesting uh, uh, losses that have very peculiar properties with four lines of code. 
And we actually used those losses and basically uh, compared how these different alphas, how different choices of being mode seeking or mode covering affects the uh, performance of the approximate distribution in a, very, in a very, very different task from what we had so far in the task of detecting adversarial examples. Mm -hmm. So over here, uh, adversarial examples in one slide is you take an input image and uh, you craft some very specific structured noise such that when you add that noise to that image, you get this image that to you looks exactly the same, but to a modern man that looks like a given rather than a pattern. Now, a couple of different uh, sample techniques like fast scanning method and iterative uh, techniques as well. I'm not going to get into that. This is fairly old results a couple of years ago. We have, as what I mentioned, that we have a few uh, newer work with uh, recent state of the art uh, 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 metrics. Uh, this is state of the art methods for adversarial example, crafting adversarial examples, uh, comparing also different types of uncertainty uh, over these, uh, uh, as uh, how effective different types of uncertainty would be to detect adversarial examples, and actually evaluating that on real world data sets other than MNIST. But over here, I have some pretty pictures with MNIST because that's an experiment that we had for the uh, Maris Alpha divergence. So, what we have over here is the following we have an image of Digit seven, and then we have a, we have amount of we have basically add one more noise to make that node seven. That's an untargeted attack, pushing that away from the class seven. Mm -hmm. For model one, two, three, and four, model one, two, three, and four, normal MVP, the VI, Hellinger distance, and, and the EP objective. We and we look basically at how as we add more and more noise how the accuracy of the different models changes, and how the predictive entropy, which is a quantity, the uncertainty quantity we talked about, what it behaves like for these different uh, models. What we find is that, first of all, the deterministic models are very much not robust, as you can see. Um, I think everyone already knows that. And what we find also is that the probabilistic models can actually, well, first of all, they're more robust. They can actually, they take long, like, a much larger perturbation size, to get to the same, uh, well, the perturbation size of 0.1 basically has a, a 0 0.7, 0 0.65 performance accuracy for alpha equals 1 versus 0.2 for normal deterministic model. Much more interesting is the predictive entropy. All the models tell us, I have no idea what's going on here. That's an image I've never seen before. I'm going to reject that. So that's pretty neat. You can actually identify the certain examples by looking at the model uncertainty. We can do the same experiment for targeted attacks as well, where we take the same image, but tell it add noise to make the model think it's a zero. So a seven, that is a, that is a zero to a deterministic model. To a Bayesian neural network, that is basically a model actually literally has to push that to look like a zero, that attack has to push it to look like a zero for the model to say, okay, that's a zero now. Uh, we have the same for, uh, for models again. You can see the accuracy on the original seven class, plummets. Accuracy on the, on the zero class, basically all the models get fooled, but also all the models, all the all the way, all the probabilistic models also tell us this is actually something you shouldn't trust this input. This is something I've never seen before. And when they, whenever they say, okay, I'm going to be very confident, but I'm going to be very confident about my prediction, the input of the model actually looks like a zero over here. So yeah, so that was the last example that I had. I think we're on time. I'm not sure when did we start. Yeah, okay. So actually, like yesterday, there's still lots of opportunity for lots of fun research on principled extensions to deep learning. I didn't talk at all about how we actually apply uh, these sort of uh, stochastic techniques in sequence models. That turns out to be a very, like, that turned out to be actually a very interesting question in the field where if you just try to apply dropout as a form of regularization in large RNNs, then it actually everything fails. And the conclusion at the time was, okay, it's just, we have to use small RNNs because dropout disturbs the dynamics of the model and so on and some other excuses. Mm -hmm. What we found is that if you actually follow the set of mathematics we had over here, we just discovered that you need to apply dropout in a slightly different way. In a slightly different way, we actually get state of that results on all the benchmarks at the time. And that technique, that slightly different way that we had like also a couple of years ago, it's implemented as the default in TensorFlow and PyTorch and whatever you're using today, any sequence model, any RNN, every time you use an LSTM, an RNN, a GRU, mm -hmm. when you add dropout, it's be, it will be using the stuff we talked about over here. And we have lots of like, other opportunity to develop new tools for safe robust machine learning and lots of other examples which I still haven't talked about 
in the medical applications to most driving and so on. Uh, and if you want to read more, go on the group website. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question about, like, when you mentioned that uh, you usually don't, like, as a rule of thumb in engineering, they say, like, wait, you shouldn't do dropout in the input. Have you found, like, any other, like, similar insights about, like, rules, like, empiric rules from engineering that now you can, like, see, like, a math foundation for them? Like, any other rules or? So, that, that, so that's actually the... <coughs> Uh, specifically in the field, patient deployment as a whole, there's lots of examples of that actually. Uh, in the work that I talked about over here, was specifically looking at one technique that is used in lots of places by lots of practitioners, but developed lots of really good intuition into when stuff works, when stuff doesn't work, but not necessarily understanding why they get that intuition, why that stuff works and why it doesn't work. So over here, we try to give some understand, build some understanding into some of, into that into some of that intuition. So we talked about why do we choose these different values, why we have that uh, input or the motor size and stuff like that. Um, the last example I mentioned now, which I encourage you to go over the paper, uh, is in the sequence models, where the rule of thumb was you should never use that in sequence models. Nothing, like it, it doesn't work. I think there's a bunch of papers, I think if I managed to find four papers, suggesting ad hoc adaptations which are try to get it to work. Now they're much work when you do uh, like a proper experimentation. And like all of them had like they started from dropout doesn't work in ILMs because of blah, and then you because it disturbs the dynamics in the model because the noise gets amplified over time and like a lot of these different uh, excuses for that for better work because instead of and trying to understand why it doesn't work they just say it doesn't work could be that it doesn't work because of blah I'm not going to bother looking at blah I'm just going to suggest an adaptation and see if we manage to fix that issue. Um, what we suggested in that other paper was saying that. Well, it could be that it doesn't work because of blah. Let's see what that does blah look like. And then you follow the same mathematics, and then you get a very different uh, technique. A diff it's still dropout, but applied in a different way. Which is a truly real different way. Just you need to tie them with the weight. You need to tie the masks between different time steps. That's all. Um, and that tiny, tiny, that tiny adaptation basically fixes the uh, empirical issues that they observed in the field. And that tiny adaptation is basically used in all the modern state of the art techniques in the NLP literature, for example. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, in your uh, objective function, could you could you put the uh, could you put the uh, objective function a little bit? I didn't quite there. there. Uh, so uh, the the first term is. You want to, to the, it's basically as a statistician, I see it, the first time is, is the likelihood. Mm -hmm. okay. That is what I like. So you, that, that is uh, maximizing the fit. And then you have the penalized. We actually, we actually have the negative log likelihood. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. we have a flip sign over here as well. Because when deep learning is minimized, but rather than maximized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the other term is the Kurwak liver divergence between the approximate posterior yep. and the prior. Yep. So you want, you want your approximate to your posterior to be as far as the uh, prior. You will, so when we minimize this, minimize this objective, when we minimize the Kurwak liver as well. So we want to be the approximate posterior as close as possible to the prior. As close as possible. Yeah. Okay, that so this objective, the log likelihood plus the pullback liable between the Q and P is mathematically the same as the pullback liable between Q and the posterior distribution plus a constant term. Okay, that, that's why you don't have a term with the prior because so, so it's already containing that, that term. Mm, that's, that, that's, that's a term with the prior. Yeah, but uh, just just the law of like in the uh, if if you would put if you would like to find the maximum of the posterior just like that okay we would put uh, minus log of the prime yeah but that's contained inside the Kullback library yeah so the yeah. the Kullback library would be the log of the pile mm -hmm. expectation respect to Q mm -hmm. 
minus the expectation minus the entropy of Q. Mm -hmm. So we have a penalty of the trying to push Q to be as spread out as possible, and the other one being the expectation of Q being as mm -hmm. close to P as possible. I might be confusing the signs over here. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Um, so, uh, but uh, one thing I, I didn't get is uh, what is actually the prior? You put additional noise on the data or...? So, the prior distribution, which I didn't actually give an explicit form over here, I did, I did give a form for that over here, but I do confusingly actually use different notation. So, a lambda over here is the same as the L mm -hmm. in the other slide. Uh, so the pi actually is normal 0, uh, 1 over L squared. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is... And that is basically where the pi comes into effect. Mm -hmm. So the, the pi basically gives you a contribution into... Basically, if you say my pi is very dispersed, mm -hmm. if you say my pi is a Gaussian distribution which is very, very wide, then I'm going to get a, a so that's basically goes to 1 over L squared. So that's going to be a very small penalty over here. That's going to basically remove the L2 penalty in the limit of very, very wide bias. In effect, basically allows you to say, you can use whatever weights that you want, I'm not, not going to penalize you. You can use very, very high frequency weights, you can basically overfit through your data. On the other hand, if you say I want to have a very a narrow, very narrow pile distribution, uh, so you say a normal one, like a normal mean zero bias like 0 0.0001, then basically saying well, most of my weights, a priori, they should be very much near the origin. So I should only have low frequencies in my function. Therefore, I should only have smooth functions. Therefore, I should have like very strong regularization. And that's basically what that L basically gives you over here. So when you have very, very narrow pi distribution, that L is going to be very, very large. That's going to give you a very large L2 penalty over the model. Basically, the weights will have to be very much near zero because of that. And you can't have this, you can't overfeed the data, you can't connect the dots to the data points. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so but uh, it all all this is basically for the normal prior. No, 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 yeah. 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 My last question. Uh, just just could you cl clarify how will you get the likelihood? What is the model of the data Y with the uh, FWXA? So in classification this could be a categorical distribution. Oh. Uh, where f would just be a probability vector, for example, an affine transformation and then a softmax, which is like logistic regression, and then this would be categorical. Um, in regression, this would be a Gaussian distribution with mean given by fw, and then vias would be 1, which is what we go off into in deep learning, because that would just give you the L2 distance between y and f. Um, you can actually learn the vias as well, which is learning the rhetoric component in the noise, and then you can optimize that would be the like Gaussian distribution with mean given by that, variance given by sigma squared, and the optimized sigma squared as well. So that's actually how we found uh, the aleatoric noise over here, literally optimizing sigma squared in the objective. I think there's a question like that? No. Okay. Um, yeah. um, uh, what did you ask? How, I mean, how universal is the principle of robot uh, inference? Uh, among all the zoo of possible architectures in the uh, neural network. Did you, I mean, um, have, you, have you guys tried in every kind of architecture? Not only the, the, I mean, the more traditional ones with multiple layers, but I don't know, um, more complex architectures. Uh, so these results hold for any modern computer vision architecture? Mm -hmm. Use convolution, like any feed forward model which uses convolutions or pooling or whatever. And this is also for electronic models like INS, STMs, GRUs, whatever, which are the which is other people that I mentioned. Um, it there could very possibly be model architectures for which you actually need to do the derivation again to find what is the correct way of applying job plot so it actually matches to the mathematics over here rather than um, applying that naively uh, out of the box. <laughs> but but indeed, yeah, the great challenge now is uh, when you want to model some prior information with uh, Q, uh, for example, some feature in the images you're analyzing or 
these the animals are such and such. Then then try to cook, uh, go that in queue. That that would be the the big challenge if if I understood correctly. Um, I think there are two answers over here. One is how do you build a biology team models, in which case it will not be in the Q, it will be in the P, I would say. In the P, yeah. Because the Q itself is just... No, 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 I meant the, the P. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Q will just be some way of approximating mm -hmm. posterior. P itself is the definition of the model, and the, the part and the likelihood of the existence of the posterior that the change of the Q. There is active research into how to build such a, a, a biodistribution speed that capture interesting properties. The Gauss that I mentioned is the simplest thing that you can imagine, which is just saying, you know, what's a smooth function of uh, the analytic function? Um, there's some recent stuff in the Bayesian Deep Learning Workshop that actually tries to do domain adaptation or transfer learning from one data to another, one model, one, one data set to another by in, like learning, doing some, uh, I don't know that to be honest, uh, like learning P distribution. There is a lot of other research on building actual structural graphic models, which I think is much more interesting, where you actually try to build a, a, a kind of like Hinton's capsules model, where you try to build, which is very much not a probabilistic model, but we have some work in trying to make that make more sense, uh, where you actually build information from uh, our assumption about how objects basically are built of components, or well, there's other work on building computer vision models informed by geometry, some of the stuff that Roberto Shikola does, uh, where you basically try to build uh, inductive biases into modern architecture that will be able to capture these sort of things. And then the approximate inference could be exactly the same. It could be informed by the modern architecture. Cool. No question. Thank you.